I had a video a couple of days ago called Pornography 101. Oh, I should just say, by the way, before I go on, I'm going to talk about Pornography 101. But I'm in the car driving down to Cornwall again, which I do every beginning of every week and then drive back at the end. And uh, I usually make a couple of videos whilst I'm driving to pass the time. But what I'm going to do in this one is rather than... I'm going to just stick them all together, basically. Because what I keep doing is I make five or six and then kind of drip feed them through the week and it's really tedious. So I'm going to just bundle them all together. So this will probably be a really long video. Um, I'll try and do some kind of a content list or something if you're really interested in the description box. But anyway, <laughs> if you're still with me, Pornography 101. It's a video I made a couple of days ago, as I say, just talking about this uh, course that a mate of mine at work are kind of developing. I mean, he's the, he's the lead on it, to be honest, because I don't, I'm not, it's not my area of expertise. Whereas this guy at work, he knows a lot about, um, well, not so much pornography, but erotic literature particularly, and the kind of theories around that. So he's driving it, and I'm running shotgun on it, I suppose, because I'm good at writing documents and that kind of thing. But it's interesting. And uh, I got a few responses. I thought I'd get a lot more responses than I did, to be honest. Uh, but that, that's fine, you know. I, don't, I guess people thought I was joking, I was just being provocative, but it's serious. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a, 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 a master's course in pornography. I mean, Gary made a comment on it on one of his what the fucks, saying that pornography wasn't art. You know, which is, I don't mind that; it's fine. But uh, that kind of wouldn't be the point, or that would be that would be a subsection of that would be one of the questions that we'd interrogate. You know. So I don't know about that really. Uh, somebody else. Oh, actually, somebody else mentioned in comments. Uh, I was just, just suggested reading, it was George Bataille. And for some reason, you know, when I was talking about it, I hadn't even thought about literature. You know, I, I just thought about pornographic films or pornographic images. Go figure, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a whole history of erotic and pornographic literature, which would probably be easier to, um, easier to sell in many ways, and certainly easier to get past ethics committees. Um, People like George Bataille, he's doing a story of the eyes, a wild piece of writing, if you ever get a chance to look at it, or, or you know, the Marquis de Sade, you know, 100 Days of Sodom, or was it Juliet, I think, one of these other ones? I mean, they are serious stuff, you know, or, you know, um, different stuff like, uh, what, like Aeneas Nin writes erotic literature, doesn't she? Uh, who else? I mean, some of it's really tedious. You know, all that, um, oh, I don't know, all that kind of bodies ripping stuff that you get in, um, I can't remember your bloody name now. Anyway, it'll come back to me. Yeah, so, it, so that, that it is, it, I think that might be quite interesting. I think we'd have to look at that anyway, pornographic literature. And just the fact that, um, that a lot of the discussion about the, uh, the legislation or the restrictions or the limitations, uh, and, and even the, um, kind of negative approaches to pornography almost always ignore the written word, don't they? No, I guess because you know, no animals were injured in the making of this book. You know, it's, I think it's partly that, you know what I mean? There is no, there's, there's, no, there's not the potential for the exploitation of an actual human being in the making of the pornography. You know, whether it has an effect on humans beyond that point, which is possibly negative, I don't know. But, uh, you know, you're not paying someone to stand in front of a camera or to, you know, do certain things in front of a video camera. You know, so it's maybe maybe it's something to do with that, really. Um, it's this camera point to me, actually. Speaking of cameras, it's a funny angle. Anyhow, so yeah, maybe a lot of erotic literature. I think that would be great to look at. If anybody still wants to respond to that, by the way, I'd still like comments and suggestions and, and critiques. You know what I mean? The interesting thing I'm finding about just thinking through this. And from some of the comments I got, is that um, you know because I'm in academia, I'm really used to treating things academically, which means having that uh, academically detached viewpoint on all these things. So when I hear someone say, I don't know, something negative or something positive about it, I don't think. Um, well, all I think is, all right, that's an interesting topic to talk about. You know what I mean? It, it builds itself into the curriculum as a debate rather than something I have to take an opinion about. I mean, I can take an opinion about them, but they're separate to the academic approach to these things. 
which annoys really irritating to some people, but that's, that's how it works, isn't it, really? Uh, if you frighten the spiders, it doesn't stop you studying them, you know what I mean? You've got to separate your feelings from the study of the thing, you know, study the phenomena. Um, sometimes. Anyhow, that's that. So yeah, pornography. <laughs> Someone also said I shouldn't have called it 101, or that it was funny I called it 101, because 101 is an introductory class. We don't have that numbering system really in, in Britain. At least in Teddy, my institution, we don't. So, um, I guess that would have been an introductory first year class in pornography, which, no, that's not that good. It would have had to be a four or a five, up in that, those numbers. The other thing I like, sorry, this is a bit tangential, but uh, this title, MA Pornography, I think one or two other people said, you know, I should dwell more on the erotic. And it, it, it does sound classier, for sure. You know, the eroticised body sounds a lot classier. But um, part of me just... I just want to get a team on University Challenge, actually. It's not University Challenge. I think in the States it's called College Ball. But University Challenge has been a staple on British television for donkey's years, really. It used to be hosted by Bamba Gascoigne, and now it's hosted by Jeremy Paxman, who's a brilliant host. And it always starts out the same, you know, you've got these two team of university students and they introduce themselves one by one and they introduce themselves by name, by what they're from, where they're from, what town they're from and what they're studying. And when they state what they're studying, they always say, I'm such and such from such and such a place, reading physics, reading biological sciences, reading uh, ancient history, you know, whatever it is, because that's the kind of technical term, you say you're reading something when you're at university. And there's been lots of jokes played on that, you know, spoof versions of University Challenge. I think the Goodies did one years and years ago, and I think uh, the Young Ones, which is another UK comedy show from about 20 years ago, they did a spoof version. And of course, when it goes to the cost of reading thing, it's inevitable, they make the joke, oh, I'm such and such from such and such, reading pornography. Ha oh, that's like a joke, you know, reading pornography. So I just think it would be great if I can get an MA in pornography on the books, somehow, get a team together on University Challenge and we can do it for real, you know, to go along there. I'm such and such from this university in the UK reading pornography. It's a very elaborate way to set up a job, but that'd be alright. Yeah, that's that. There was something else I was going to say about pornography. Oh, I know what it was. Yeah, of course. The, um, this came as a bit of a surprise to me. It might come as a bit of a surprise to one or two other people as well. But you made, I made a a couple of videos a while back, about three or four weeks ago, maybe less, about, uh, what was it called, something like the evolution of consciousness and the pornographic imagination, something like that, it wasn't the evolution, but I don't know, origins of consciousness, origins of consciousness and the pornographic imagination, which is just this idea I had in the back of a fag packet really about, you know, where, where does this idea of consciousness come from, and, uh, it, it sprang out of a little article I saw in, Sci in Scientific American just talking about some unusual um, abilities that humans seem to have in terms of sexual fantasy and I just stuck those ideas together and made this, made this little proposal together a set of videos into a proposal about a paper I'd like to do at an academic conference called, as I say, The Origins of Consciousness in the Pornographic Imagination you know, basically just hypothesising that before we learn to think as the way we do now, all this abstraction and conceptualisation and all that kind of stuff, this highly developed imagination we've got, which allows us to imagine ourselves and imagine the world at the same time, all that, all that stuff I've talked about before, that the origins of that could have lain in our ability to have sexual fantasies. Because if you have a sexual fantasy, if you're able to have sexual fantasies as some kind of early primate, you're, particularly for male primates, I have to say, your, um, you may have a reproductive advantage, particularly if you've got free hands, for various reasons. Anyway, I just came up with this fairly, I think, probably fairly specious um, idea, you know, or at least only partially supported idea, an easily critiqued idea. But I sent it off as an abstract to a conference, quite a prestigious conference actually, on consciousness studies. It's hosted by the University of Arizona at Tucson, but it's held in different cities each year. This year it's in Stockholm, I think in July or something, I can't remember the dates now, in Stockholm. But anyway, I got an email from Stuart Hammerhoff this morning, who's the organiser, saying, uh, your paper's been accepted. 
So all being well, it's going to be like I can raise a couple of hundred quid to get myself across to Stockholm and I'll speak to my institution this week. And uh, I'm off to Stockholm, Sweden. <laughs> Go figure. To talk about the pornographic imagination. Could be better, really, could it? I mean, that, that's a perfect city to do that. Maybe that's what swung it, I don't know. So I'll let you know how that goes. If you're at all interested, and there's no reason why you should be, but if you are at all interested in what I sent off, I did read it out in a video. It was a kind of comedy video, actually, featuring Nat Gary <laughs> doing his mumbo-jumbo thing. But um, I'll leave a link to the video where I read out what I sent off. Um, go figure. Anyway, that's great. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. It's, it's, it, I'm, I'm, I haven't actually been to that conference before, but I have been to lots of conferences. Excuse me, spitting all over the fucking place. I have been to lots of um, con consciousness conferences. Not recently, but I used to go to quite a few. And they are interesting, you know. And in a sense, the, the papers are only... They're the least important part in many ways. I mean, the, the idea of them really is just to get people together in the, same, in the same place with a shared interest. That's the idea. And then the papers allow you to announce your general area of interest. So you can gather in smaller groups outside and in the bar and at the meals and that kind of thing and talk about it. But that's where the real uh, conversations take place. So, um, so I don't feel like a fraud, you know what I mean? So I've got a genuine interest in this area. And I'd like to talk to people who share that interest, so I think that's fine. There we are, that's Stockholm. I don't think I'll have to take a recording of Gary singing Mumbo Jumbo, I'm sure. I might, but I don't think I'd need to do that. <laughs> anyway, what else? Um, yeah, I'll leave it now. Okay. Just passed a wagon and it said, eat more chips on the side. Eat more chips. Tomorrow is the 19th, I think. Let's check. Yeah, the 19th of January which is my three year anniversary on YouTube. I hadn't realized, I was just looking through this morning because I wanted to do some stuff on my channel. And I realized that I saw my first video and I noticed the date, it was 19th of January, three year ago. I watched the first video I made actually. I mean, it's crap quality because it was made on an old Sony Ericsson camera. So it's really jerky. It's even jerky than it was on the camera. So someone must have happened with the processing. And I got no beard, I look like a much younger man. That was pretty good, actually. It's weird how it changes, you know what I mean? Because uh, I was really, I don't know, not exactly nervous, but um, I wasn't used to just speaking aloud. Uh, so I felt so, so self-conscious doing it, even though there was no one around. I quite liked it, actually. It's called Space of Knowing 2, which is a bit mysterious. That means I must have made a Space of Knowing 1, but um, it's not on there, so I guess I must have either deleted it or something, I don't know. I don't remember deleting anything. Maybe I just never uploaded it. I don't know. I've no idea. Anyhow, it's fascinating really to look back. I'm still talking about the same shit, that's the thing. But I, I don't, yeah, I, I talk about some different things. A lot of things I talk about are exactly the same things I've been talking about for years and years. Just keep going back to them again and again and again. With a different hat on. Weird that. Anyhow, it's been great. It's been great, I tell you. It's three. Well, it's been a mixed bag, but generally it's been great. I've thoroughly enjoyed this three years on YouTube. We're getting to Norfolk. Kind of. Yeah. Fuck off! Well, that Thunderfoot never responded to my videos, suggesting he um, upgrade his channel to make it more participatory so I guess he's either not seen those videos or no one's told him about the idea or he just thinks it's a shit idea maybe it is maybe it is a shit idea I did suggest it to Zongitz but she um, didn't really want to do that I think she'd have to do it differently anyway you know what I was suggesting to Thunderfoot is that he do effectively what Richard Dawkins done with, with his website you know, which is basically fronts the organisation, keeps his hand in enough to give it his identity, to keep his identity branded on it, but then um, post a lot of other content and just foster debate, really, foster conversation. Because if you look at richarddawkins.net, 
it has that same kind of mix I think the Thunderfoot does, obviously in a different register, but it's the same mix of sciencey things, basically ponage of stupid creationist or you know bad religious practices, outing of um, religious abuses, those kind of things, uh, and, and items of general interest to people who are interested in science and reason really. So it's that bridge between uh, the God Delusion and uh, River Out of Eden that Dawkins does, which I think Thunderfoot does, you know what I mean? It's the ponies that gets the views, that's, you know, people are really interested in watching people get pwned, there's no doubt about that. And I think probably the same is true on Richard Dawkins.net website. People keep coming back because of the insulting articles about the Pope, but, uh, you know, they come for the insults and stay for the science, really. So um, I think Thunderfoot effectively has the same... Um, USP, isn't it? Unique selling point. I think it's the same, it's coming from the same place, really. But uh, anyway, I guess he doesn't want to do that, that's absolutely fine. A bit of a shame, though, really, because I just, I mean, I don't have any particular investment in Thunderfoot or any of that kind of stuff, really. I just like the idea of bottom up organisations. You know what I mean? I just like the idea that uh, a group of people or an individual or a set of individuals in a, in a site such as YouTube. Can, uh, can build their way up, you know what I mean? And particularly build their way up through social media, you know what I mean? Because a lot of the people who are trying to build their way up, and I guess people like the Amazing Atheist, UTJ, if you watch this, um, are trying to, you know, up their game. But they're up in their game by effectively moving away from a social media model towards a broadcast media model. You know what I mean? You, you, you get your presentation better so it looks more and more like television or more and more like film. Maybe you make a film, as TJ has done. Um, you, you come away from commenting, you come away from um, making video responses. So some, you know, some other people may want to do that, comments of course happen, but they're kind of an adjunct to what you're doing, you're not really part of that. Lacey Green's another example I think. Um, you, know, you can easily imagine Lacey Green being, on, being a, an interstitial on some TV show of some kind, you know what I mean, easily. Uh, MTV kind of, MTV light, you know, that kind of thing. You can easily imagine that kind of thing happening, I think. So it's a, essentially a broadcast model. I mean, Lacey Green's interesting. She does try and keep her, she does do the, she does respond to comments, or she does make comments, but they're really just, um, uh, what? I don't know what to call them, really. Affirmations, aren't they, really? She doesn't get involved in discussion. She just uh, keeps her hand in, keeps her presence, makes her presence felt a little bit. So that's a good strategy, you know, it's, it's, um, it works very well, I think. You know, whether you like Lazy Green's channel or not, it's academic, but I think that, uh, that just keeping a little bit of, uh, keeping her face in the comment section by egging people on or making positive comments or slightly suggestive comments or whatever, it, it works very well. But as I say, it's essentially a broadcast model, not a social media model. Social media models are ones in which there is interchangeability between producers and consumers, and it's a, a network of, you know, kind of interrelated makings and viewings, and that's not what TJ and Lacey Green do, which is fine, you know, it's not a criticism in any way, it's just an observation. But as I say, the, um, at the moment, not that I, not that I know of at least, I mean, maybe I just don't know, the, at the moment there's no one in the and the YouTube community that I'm familiar with, who is trying to up the uh, up the stakes in the social media game, as opposed to leaving that game and joining the broadcast media game. Uh, and I think it could be done. You know, I think you would need a, as I say, a large subscriber base, such sort of critical mass involved in that. Um, if, if for no other reason than to provide some funding for it, you know, so you can get some partnership cash out of it really but, but there's other reasons as well I think just in terms of, of driving the thing forward anyway Zomgits would have to do it different you Zomgits if you watch this just as an aside by the way I've started I don't think it'll interest anybody else apart from me this but I'm, I'm starting to try and get into the habit of always talking to the person that I mentioned because one thing I really hate and it's, as I say it's probably purely personal is being addressed in the third person you know, he did this, he did that, particularly in comments, but in videos as well. So, 
I'm trying to develop this protocol where I, if I mention someone like Lacey Green or like Zongits or like the Amazing Atheist or anybody really, I'll start off by announcing their username, their first name if I know it, like TJ, or, you know the vernacular name if I know it, and then I'll start using first person. So that's what I'm, it's, it's just a habit, so you know. So Zongits, you Zongits, if you're listening to this, um, you would have to do something different there. You would have to, uh, you couldn't do the, as he rightly pointed out, I think, when he made a comment, you know, you couldn't do what Thunderfoot does. Uh, maybe, I think you probably could, actually, but I, I, think, I think because your your channel identi identity is very different to Thunderfoot's, you know, yours is much more personality-driven. You've got a much um, more kind of visible front-end, if you know what I mean. Sorry, that sounds really crude. No, no it's, um, I didn't mean that in any kind of, um, just move on, Fred, move past this moment. You know, it, you know, you're, you're, it's personality driven in a way that Thunderfoot isn't, and Thunderfoot admits to this. You know, he, uh, you know, he said when that, when he made that video where he interviewed PC Myers and people critiqued him because he was wearing shorts, or when he did the Richard Dawkins interview and he's holding his glass of water really uncomfortably in his hands the whole time. You know, he rightly said, "Look, I'm an academic. We don't care about stuff like that." It isn't exactly true, actually, but um, he is a particular kind of academic or a particular kind of researcher, a particular kind of YouTuber. Who clearly does not care about that. I think it's, always, it's interesting to note, of course, that both PC Myers and Richard Dawkins in those interviews, very prestigious scientists, are extremely well turned out and present themselves fantastic. So you, you can do both, but it's not it's not in uh, it's not part of Thunderfoot's remit to do that. Really, he's, he's expressed he's not interested in it. Why should he be? Whereas I think for you, Zomkits, it is. You know, and. Um, that's, that's fine, you know what I mean? I think you need that quite often. You know, presentational style is really important when you're trying to communicate information. Um, and just trying to keep people in the game, really. So you could do it, undoubtedly, Zongits, but uh, as I say, you would be different. You couldn't hand over all the content and just act as a kind of... Uh, you would just, couldn't just lend your name to it. You would have to front it much more. You could do it. You know, the way I would do it if I was you, I'm not suggesting for one second you should, um, I would probably do one a month, something like that. You know, one guest just host one a month. Or one out of three, something like that. So you do two and then you host and then you mirror the third one. But you'd have to introduce it. You know, so you would you know, do the, the thing you do with the good edits and all that kind of stuff. Introducing what the video is about. And maybe even make comments in the middle of it. You know, like Beavis and Butthead used to do during those probably don't know this, but Beavis and Butthead, when they used to be on MTV, they used to uh, introduce songs, introduce music videos. It was great, actually. It was better than before they started doing full episodes. So they'd introduce the episode, but they would come in halfway through, you know, you would hear voiceovers. And uh, well, maybe you would cut away from the song for a second and just show what they were doing, you know, but they were rocking out or something like that. It was really, it was really funny. You know, something like that, I think, would work better. You know, so it, you could, you would mirror someone's video and then there'd be a little image of you at the side doing a thumbs up or something or uh, or uh, I don't know a noddy headshot of some kind now that, that I think you would need that constant presence to keep keep it branded properly but as I say that's just it's just me exercising thinking really take my notice if you're not interested what you're doing is fine you know no criticism intended uh, yeah how am I going to talk about this wonderful yeah. Yeah, I don't know what he's going to do. I guess, I guess people are sending him money, so he's alright now. It's a land of lost opportunity, I think. Anyhow, I'll move on. Sainsbury's! I'm just driving through Birmingham here, this elevated bit. Quite like this section, I don't know why. But uh, I've just passed a poster for the Take That, you know, the band Take That, that Robbie Williams used to front, I guess because they had a new album out in November. It's quite a nice poster actually, it's like a big yellow backdrop and then this, what appears to be a guy either taking flight or possibly just jumping, you know, in instalments. It's like a stop motion animation thing. And he just says, take that! And every time I see that poster, I always think, somebody should write, you bastard, underneath. So it says, take that, you bastard! Sorry, that's really fucking infant. Take that, you bastard. Bored. 
I'm just driving near Birmingham here, and this is I'm approaching the intersection with the M6, M5, M42, M40 that I spoke about in um, a video I made a couple of days ago, Schadenfreude, where I told the story of how this lad, uh, how old boy with the details, but this, this lad I knew uh, crashed down here, crashed, ah! and was killed hitting the bridge support at 85 because he tried to change the lanes too quick. And uh, I must say, I drive past here all the time. And I, 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 I never think of that. You know, it never occurs to me now. Now, of course, I've said that it probably will occur to me every single time. But it's funny how some places do associate with events. You know, particularly deaths. I think. You know, in the little town where I live, there's a just outside a news agent. There's a lamp post that's always got a bunch of flowers attached to it. Because a young lad, he was only about 13 or 14, I think, he was uh, he was crushed by a bus. I don't know exactly how it happened. He fell off or something. There was I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, it all got a bit sticky and he, he got crushed under the bus right there. And uh, you know, someone always puts a bunch of flowers there for him. You know what I mean? So it's located very, very precisely. And I guess if I was one of his parents or a friend of his, you know. It would be even more striking. I wouldn't need a bunch of flowers to remind me that this is the place that this lad had died. You know, it'd be permanently imprinted. You know, the relationship between that place and that event would be so hard to break, wouldn't it? You know, you couldn't. Well, I don't think you could break it. I think it would just be endlessly contaminated in that way. I read a science fiction story about that a long time ago. I used to read a lot of sci-fi. Can't remember the author, but it was a. Just a short story about the, about this astronaut's wife, and, and she was um, she was very nervous because he used to go off and do all these missions, you know. And she was very nervous about what would happen if he died, and uh, you know if he died on one of the moons of Saturn or the moons of Jupiter, it meant that meant there'd be, there'd be some point of light in the sky that she would never be able to look at again, you know, and that, that the sky was kind of haunted with the potential for death. And, uh, well, I don't know, it's obviously a, a, a range of other star systems that you can see with a telescope, and she'd never be able to point a telescope in that direction if her husband had died in that star system. In the end, he, he died by crashing into the sun, so she never went out during the day again. Yeah, it's funny that. Places and memory. Steering with my knees. Just kidding, I'm fine really. No panic. I made a video a couple of days ago that I couldn't upload because it was really windy and the sound quality was shit. And it was a shit video, but it was about uh, social media and theatre actually, or media and theatre, because obviously my job is maybe not obvious, but my job is in theatre, I teach theatre. And, um, you know, and many years ago, before I went to education, I used to work in theatre companies, small-scale touring theatre companies, experimental theatre, performance art, that kind of end of it. Not Broadway, West End, you know, that kind of stuff. It was the small-scale touring, as I say. And there's a big difference, actually, in that, which I've come on to. And I think it maps on, and that difference between you know, those two types of theatre, I think maps quite well onto the difference between social media and something like broadcast media. So I just want to just exercise a few minutes, seeing if I can just pull that out. What I mean by that? I mean, first off, the differences. You know, if you're if you're involved in, and I'm speaking specifically from a UK perspective, it might be different to other parts of the world. But certainly in the UK, if you're involved in small-scale touring theatre, as I was, um, it's a very small world for a kickoff. You, you pretty much know everybody who's doing it. Uh, you might not know them terribly well personally, but you'll know about them. You'll know what uh, what their latest show is if they're making a show. You'll know. You'll probably know if they've, if they've secured any grants from any kind of grant awarding authority. You'll know if they've been invited to festivals. You'll probably know what their touring circuits like. You know whether they've got gigs in the same places of you, or whether they've managed to secure gigs where you haven't. Um, you know, you love a, you love a. a general knowledge about all the things that they're doing um, and quite likely you will know one or two of them personally 
and if they're performing in the town near you, you'll go and see them and hang about in the bar with them afterwards possibly. It's quite likely if you're in a company situation that some people in the company that you're working with might well be in, have worked in, their, in that company or in the company that they've been in. It's all a bit kind of six degrees of separation. In fact, it's slightly tangential, but there's a great uh, website called Band to Band. I'll put the link in the description box. But, but Band to Band is a website which allows you can, you can put any, the two names of any musicians in them and it'll find the links between them. You know, this musician was in this band with this other guy who was in this band with this woman who was in this band with this guy. That, you, know, so you, you can find the six degrees of separation that connects all band members. Well, there's a similar kind of thing happens, although it's even more closely knit, in small-scale touring theatre, and experimental theatre, at least in the UK. You know, everybody knows everybody else, pretty much. Everybody's got some kind of working connection to somebody else. And most of the audience are also connected. If not directly, then slightly, kind of indirectly. Most of the audience for, for this kind of work is either uh, students of theatre or the arts more generally, or friends of students, or you know, some, somebody in a related field, that kind of thing. It's very rare you get, um, or comparatively rare, you get people who are completely divorced from that whole world, you know. It's always, it's, it's quite tight-knit. I mean, there's lots and lots of people involved in it, you know, if you include all the audiences. But it's still relatively tight-knit and closed, and not closed, but it's social. It's a, it's a social network. Um, which makes it sound very elitist, and I think in some ways it is, but it's, there's no money in it, so it's not like an elite, it's not like a moneyed elite, it's just a, an elite that be absolutely like the same stupid things, really. Um, now, that's, that's small-scale theatre. Large-scale theatre is completely different. You know, the things that people tend to associate with theatre, including people who come into it, I think, things like the West End or Broadway or, you know, any of the, the, the large venues, and the large companies, the well-known companies, it's just completely different. You know, the, the, there's a massive separation between audience and performer, usually. Um, it's unlikely that, you know, the actors from one company will trot along to see the performance of another company. It, it doesn't have the same kind of thing going on there. It's not a social situation. It's very much a producer-consumer situation. And there's a big separation between the people who make the stuff and the people who watch the stuff. Completely different. Um, and there's no, there's, no, there's no interchangeability, you know what I mean? So you're not audience for one for a piece of work one night and then performing in, the, in your own piece the next night. That just never happens. Um, well, not really, not in any meaningful sense. So that's, how, that's what I think is a, a really substantial difference between small-scale touring theatre and large-scale theatre. But uh, I think the same thing happens in, in this medium, you know what I mean? Particularly, I guess it didn't become evident, at least it didn't become evident to me, until social media became possible. You know, because media, up until, you know, really recently, has been essentially a kind of broadcast or communication, one of those two, isn't it? You know, you either communicate through the telephone or you broadcast through the television. That's pretty much it. Social media is very different. The linking together of people in these networks with network like YouTube being a case in point is a, is a new configuration and the interchangeability of producers and consumers you know you're watching my video and listening to this if you can't bear to look at my face then um, but it's in all likelihood I'll be watching you and listening to you tomorrow or I'll be reading your comments and you'll be reading mine a large degree of interchangeability and even if you're not a video maker yourself um, I don't think you're a consumer in the same way that people consume broadcast media or people cons consume large-scale touring theatre. It's just different, I think. You know, small-scale theatre is much more like social media. It has the same kind of organisations, same kind of frameworks, same kind of interchangeability of producers and consumers. Proceed. Hi there, mate. Hi, guy. Back to sleep. I was looking at this video from Iomith Per yesterday, 
from yourself, Iron Myth Burr, yesterday. It was called something like Street Harassment or Being Harassed in the Street. I can't remember the title. The graphic was of a, a cartoon of a woman walking and then nice ass, nice ass on the back. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's fascinating that and it's and really surprising and quite shocking. I, I remember being quite, I'm not shocked now because I've heard it so many times, but I remember being quite shocked when I was younger, you know, hearing from either a girlfriend or a, you know, somebody I was in a, a class with or something like that, um, just how common it was. You know what I mean? Because I mean, I've, I've spoken, like, when it, yeah, I guess when I was in my late teens, early 20s, you know, I'd ask, has this ever happened to you? You know, <laughs> and inevitably, the girl would say, oh, yeah, yeah, this guy jerked off and I was watching him when I was 13, and this guy grabbed my boobs when I was 15. And, these three blokes followed me home and were shouting things at me when I was 17. You know, every, it seemed to me, every, certainly every woman I've spoken to has got a little list of things like that, which is really, as I say, it was quite shocking first time I heard it. It's, uh, it's weird, isn't it? And they, you know, I mean, I'm sure it was very distressing for them. Well, I guess it was distressing for them at the time, but certainly when they related it to me, it was like, a, you know, <laughs> It's a no-brainer, of course they've had that, yeah, of course, you know what I mean? It's like they completely took it in this stride, at least in the way that they expressed the experience. So, that, so, but, so part of the surprise that I had was just a sheer nonchalance, which which they were able to describe experiences, which if it happened to me, I think would have been pretty surprising. Um, and then I thought, well, I wonder if I've ever done that. And of course I have, you know I mean? Not recently, and not for, well, not for as long as I can remember, really. But certainly, when I was a younger man, I do remember, probably only on two or three occasions, to be honest, but two or three occasions, you know, making a comment about how attractive somebody was. I don't remember ever saying nice ass. That's not something in the English lexicon, but um, I, can, I can certainly remember saying that kind of stuff. Or just looking a bit too long and a little bit too low, you know. Just, just letting your eyes just go a little bit too low and just leaving them a little bit too long. And that's pretty much all it takes, isn't it? Two or three episodes like that. If all of us men do that two or three times, and I'm sure most people do it at least two or three times in their entire life, then, uh, you know, that's it. And can go further. Obviously, some people would go further than that. Then that's enough to create a, a kind of wire society, isn't it, really? That's all it would take. I'm thinking Laura Mulvey. Laura Mulvey, the male gaze. Anyhow. I mean, the other thing about that, and this is something I've uh, heard about more recently, because obviously I'm quite a bit older than that now, and uh, and my women friends I have, I don't have that many women friends, but the women friends I have are obviously around about my age, and, um, and one of the things I hear from them occasionally is not that they're being harassed, but that the harassment has stopped. And they didn't notice it until it stopped, like one of those annoying noises, you know what I mean? You get completely used to an annoying noise, and then when it stops you shouldn't be aware of the silence. And the silence is almost threatening because it's, you know, it's, it's kind of anticipation in it or something like that. You're kind of leaning on the, si on the sound somehow, I don't know if that makes any sense. But certainly one or two women have said that to me, that, um, not quite in those terms, but, you know, they walk down the street now and nobody wolf whistles. Nobody says nice arse or nice tits. Nobody follows them home. Um, you know, not all that stuff's disappeared. Which should be nice, shouldn't it? It should be a relief, you know what I mean? It should be peaceful and calm and unthreatening. But, uh, but they almost invariably describe it in a way which is somewhere between wistful and um, kind of vertiginous, you know, as if there's a sense of vertigo approach to it. As if these eyes and these, maybe even hands, are kind of propping them, propping their self-image up in some way. And when the gaze was taken away, the self-image was what was flopping about a bit, you know. That's kind of the sense I got from that. Strange that, really, isn't it? Yeah, bathrooms and kitchen. I mean, it's not surprising in some ways that uh, people like myself, men, I by that I mean, you know, do think it's okay to look at women. I'm not saying it's not okay, by the way, I'm just 
pointed this out. I said, well, because I watched the, one of the Star Trek movies last week. I don't know what it's called. I, I can't remember what it's called, but it was one of the, it was a recent one. And uh, it's when James T. Kirk is born. He's born during the court. Well, he's, he's born at the same moment that his dad dies in this exploding ship. His dad is a hero, pilots this ship towards this uh, no attacking massive vessel. Uh, and uh, the rest of the crew escapes. But James T. Kirk is born that brought that was, was born at that moment and he grows up and he's a bit of a reprobate. And so this this uh, film sets the scene for what kind of a person James T. Kirk ultimately turns out to be. And he's and he's a complete womanizer, of course, just like he is in the early Star Trek episodes, you know. He's always looking at girls' boobs and at their legs and stuff, you know. And it's the same in this in this film, as I say, this recently made film. As a young man, you know, uh, Dr. McCoy, the guy who's playing a young version of Dr. McCoy, is constantly trying to lead him off to go and do something official. And uh, and the young James T is wanting to, you know, he's just like he's looking around like this, you know, looking at girls' legs and wanting to follow them home. Strange that. I mean, it's completely normalised, you know what I mean? It's almost, it's kind of intended to be funny, I guess. And uh, it's slightly ironic given that we know of James T Kirk later on, but uh, it's weird, isn't it, that? that's in a sense what Iron Myth Burr was talking about in that video in a way. And I remember in, uh, when I was a kid I used to read uh, Archie magazines. You know, it's an American magazine but we used to get, I used to get them from Rockstar Market. I don't know why they sell them there but uh, yeah Archie and Jughead and all those people. Jughead was my favourite by the way. And I remember one episode where um, Archie and Jughead are off to do something, I can't remember what it is, you know, these two cartoon characters in this comic. They're off to do something. And two girls walk past the opposite direction carrying tennis rackets. And Archie says, Man, look at those groovy foxes, he says. Man, look at those groovy foxes. And then he does it at the 180 and says, Then it's going to be tennis for Archie too. And off he goes and he leaves Jughead behind. And again, I mean, obviously it's just young courtship isn't it, it's kind of fine, but at the same time it's also this kind of hunter hunted, it's one gender doing the looking, the other doing the looked at thing. I think I can even remember thinking, oh that's an interesting line, perhaps I should use that, perhaps I should bring that kind of phraseology into my conversation, perhaps I can say things like, man look at those groovy foxes, now it's going to be tennis for Fred too. I don't think it would have uh, cut much ice, really. <laughs> Man, look at those groovy foxes. And now I take the A30, not the A38 to Plumpton Torquay, the A30 to Bodmin and Oakhampton. Bodmin. Tell me if you think this is a really crap idea. There's a, a YouTube gathering in Liverpool, I can't remember when, it's either February or March or some, sometime, sometime in the next couple of months anyway, which I'm going to try and get to if I can, but uh, I was thinking wouldn't it be great if it was like a YouTube live thing, I don't know if you, I don't seen if there's still a YouTube live, but certainly a couple of years ago YouTube did this thing called YouTube live where they basically hosted like a live event in which various YouTube stars uh, did their thing, you know, and it was it was like Star Wars kid. It wasn't Star Wars kid. But it was that kind of that kind of person, you know, the people with massive um, hit counts, viral people, and musicy type people. But I thought wouldn't it be great to do like a small social media version of YouTube Live, you know, whatever. I don't even know what the venue this is going to be at. We've got a venue at D Land and Cole. You're the man, aren't you? You're organising this. Have we got a venue yet? If you want any help with the organisation of that, by the way, let me know. Uh, yeah, but YouTube Live, wouldn't that be great? You know, people just agree to do a to make a live video there and then, you know. So someone could do a rant. Maybe someone could do uh, something funny. I'd do one of my rabbit things. That'd be funny. Live. Uh, what else? It could be a series of have kind of debate, you know, someone could propose something and an hour later someone could do a video response. That'd be fun, wouldn't it? And it would all be recorded, you know what I mean? 
Anyhow, it's probably a shit idea actually. It's probably a really bad idea. Anyhow, Liverpool's nice. Liverpool's a really nice town actually. I used to go to Liverpool quite regularly. One of my mates used to work in the magistrates' courts there. A guy called Dave. And uh, it was really funny actually because he was, a, he was a, a, a real party animal, Dave. He loved going clubbing, and there's some fantastic nightclubs in Liverpool that were then anyway, this is years and years ago now. And he loved to drink. And uh, every time I go over there, we'd go out and you know have a few beers and then go on to a club somewhere. And he'd invariably meet a load of people that were one of his customers, so to speak, in court. You know, basically gangsters. Very strange. But they were fantastic places. And good Chinese food to be had. At least then, it might be horrible now, what do I know? What do I know? I don't even know what county I'm in. I think I'm still in Devon. Am I in Devon? I'm in Devon, and my heart beats so that I can hardly speak. And I can't believe there's something, something, something. When we're out together dancing cheek to cheek. Now there's this guy who just passed me in a Beamer, a BMW, not a particularly new one. The license plate is 9B. 9B. They must have paid 250 grand for that license plate, I bet. What a waste of time, what a wanker! Wanker! I usually do this when I see people like that. Wanker! Like that. Wanker! been thinking some more about social media and what happens, well the difference between social media and broadcast media again. Now I'm trying to think of other analogies. You know, I did one about theatre a few miles back. But I'm thinking about it in terms of music and uh, you know the, the kind of seminal music experiences that I had as I was growing up in my teens and early twenties was punk rock music. I mean that's the, that was the kind of music I, I suppose I identified with mostly at that time. And it was, it was very interesting. The early days of, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of myths around the early days of punk. And it, and that, but, you know, there was Svengali's and, um, and corporate interests right there from the start, really. But outside of that, you know, apart from the Malcolm McLarens and all that kind of stuff, there was, it was a, a very particular kind of social situation. You know, certainly most of the people who were in bands in those early days knew one another. You know, it was very closely knit. You know, I'm reminded of people like the Bromley Contingent, which is the, um, the group of people in, in Bromley, in, on the outskirts of London, some of whom were uh, appearing on, quite famously appeared on the Bill Grundy show when the Sex Pistols were first interviewed by Bill Grundy, and in which they used the word fuck quite a few times on daytime TV and it made a big splash in the papers. But, you know, but also present alongside the Pistols, were a bunch of other punks, you know, including Susie and the Banshees, Susie Sue from Susie and the Banshees. And these people all knew one another, you know? And they were all equally crap at playing music, really, but all equally kind of interested and inspired and passionate and um, empowered in a kind of weird, nihilistic way by this whole scenario, really. Um, so that, as I said, those early days of punk, apart from the Svengali figures, were quite like, again, quite like social media. No great deal of interchangeability between producers and consumers. No great separation between who the audience is and who the performer is. It's, you know, you went to a gig and there'd probably be 70 people there, maybe, tops. Probably half of whom were in a band or trying to be in a band. Uh, and, you know, at, at, at any point, you know, it could have been interchangeable who was on the stage and who wasn't. You know, it's fairly arbitrary. Um, and quite often, those things would change. And, uh, you know, th and I think that has something in common with the way that social media works. I mean, we don't think, at least I've never thought about punk or early, early stages of any kind of social movement or musical movement as, um, as a kind of social media analogue. But I think they are. I think there's some parallels there. I really do. I mean, what's interesting for me there is what happens at a certain point. Because obviously, in the music industry, the... the Eventually, in punk and as in other movements, you know, somebody breaks through, somebody becomes famous, some bands get picked up and get promoted and do the world tour and become enormously popular. 
breaks in here, which you can either think of it as breaking through or selling out. But that's an interesting moment, isn't it, when that happens? I mean, for, for me, the seminal moment that in, in terms of punk was when a band called The Exploited, which is like third generation renter punks, really, were on the um, on top of the Pops TV pop music show introduced by Radio 1 DJ David Kidd Jensen. And uh, there's a clip on, on YouTube of, of that moment, which is just fantastic. Um, and they weren't the first to, to be breakthrough by any means. You know, we'd already had people like the Tom Robinson Band and The Damned and one or two others who'd been picked up by record companies. But funny things happen at that moment, don't they? You know, when, when you either break through or sell out. It changes the nature, not just of... It's, it's not that they just step gracefully out of one medium into another. It changes the medium itself. You know, when those people became popular, sold out, um, it changed the medium, it changed the, the, the social fabric of this small community of musicians playing together and, and activists and whoever else there were, nihilists and anarchists and punks. It changed the nature of that social organisation. You know, it suddenly it became the case that, um, that this little DIY culture, this do-it-yourself culture of music making, instead of being a thing in itself, it was just the kind of um, rehearsal room for the real thing, you know what I mean? So you did the small scale thing first, but really you were just waiting to be discovered so you could break through as a as a as a major player and have Kid Jensen introduce you on top of the pops. You know what I mean? So it devalued. I, I just I just reinterpreted what the social fabric and the social music media life world was really. Um, you know, as I say, instead of being a thing in itself, it became a a rehearsal room or a prover in camp, or just a place for failures. You know, if you were if you're in there, relentlessly going around doing the gigs, seeing each other's music, and you weren't moving on, then suddenly that became a sign of failure. Whereas it hadn't been before; it was the thing in itself before, but suddenly it was a failure to do that. And the, and, the, those, and the other effect was, of course, it changed the the nature of the audience. You know, whereas before, if you were in small you know, you did these small uh, gigs with 70 people there if you were lucky. Suddenly, you know, because people like the Exploited or whoever, Tom Robinson band, uh, whatever, you know, managed to break through, suddenly there was an audience for punk music. So I'd said there'd been 70, there'd be 400 people at a gig. Only a few of whom were actually at all interested in doing that thing upon the stage. You know, suddenly there was a big separation between producer and consumer, between uh, performer and audience. And the demands of this new audience, which was different, you know, they weren't really the demands of a kind of DIY culture. Um, it was the demands of people who wanted to see a slick performance. Yeah, slick, slightly anarchic, slightly threatening, punky performance with safety pins and razor blades. But nevertheless, still a kind of... Um, something professional. They wanted to see the Top of the Pops version of it live, you know, and go home afterwards and do something completely different. They, they weren't participants in the, in the social, in the live social media experience. So the whole so the whole thing changed, really, at that point. I guess it's like when Dylan went electric, you know, it, it's that, something, something changes there, really. And I think the same is, I don't know if it's true or not, really, I'm going to say the same is true of something like YouTube. But I'm, at least it is in some people's minds, and I kind of wish it wasn't really, because I, I really like the idea of social media, and it's different to broadcast media and communications media. And uh, I think when those of us who, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but you know, we are involved in social media, and when we aspire to do something else, I think we are in danger of making that kind of mistake about what we're actually doing here. Or maybe it's not a mistake, maybe it's absolutely the right thing, I don't know. But I do hear people on here, most recently Mel's basket case, you Mel, and I'm not blaming you, it's a, it's a commonly expressed sentiment, uh, most recently, you know, kind of mourning the fact that her views were relatively low, only in the hundreds, and her subscriptions were relatively low, only in the couple of thousands or whatever it was, which, um, you know, when we, we, we have that kind of uh, subscriber whore anxiety, don't we? You know, at least that's part of the 
notionally the mark of success here, you know what I mean? You suddenly get a high size subscriber and we all kind of congratulate one another when we pass a big subscriber threshold. But it's some, but, the, the, but it's a it's a different game, I think. And I kind of wish we could avoid doing that and find ways to applaud and support and recognise the social media functionality, really, rather than just seeing social media and a couple of hundred subscribers and a couple of hundred views as either, as I say, as a failure, because we haven't skyrocketed to the hundreds of thousands, or as a, just a, a rehearsal room until we get better at it. We could stop doing this kids' social media stuff and do the broadcast media stuff. You know, we can get a director in to make really nice movies for us. And we can get an introduction. I fucking hate introductions, by the way. No offence, man, if you've got an introduction, but I do hate them. You know what I mean? We're just waiting to gussy ourselves up a bit so we can uh, break through, break away from being uh, a relatively flat, non-hierarchical structure of sharing, of, sh of this kind of ambivalent producer-consumer things that we are, just trying to push it through and become broadcast media people. That's a shame, really. That's a shame. I don't want Kid Jensen to introduce me on top of the pops. I really don't. But I would like, like to find a way of strengthening or recognising social media and rewarding value and rewarding good practice somehow, whatever that means. I don't know what it is, but what it means even. But I'd like to find a way to do that. Because at the moment, the only way that good practice is considered, really, in YouTube is in, subs is in subscriber numbers and viewing numbers. And that's not a metric for measuring quality social media, that's a metric for measuring broadcast media. Anyway, I'm, there's an ambulance coming up behind now, just south of Bristol. So I'll pull to one side, let the ambulance go past. There he goes, South West Ambulance Service. And now I'm in Cornwall. Hi there, guy. Hello. Come on, mate. Something I think would be really interesting in terms of like social media, particularly YouTube, is what would happen. You see what would happen if, if uh, I guess you'd have to be YouTube to do this. If YouTube kind of uh, enforced its social media structure, you know, or at least uh, encouraged that in a different way through, through the technology and through the protocols that it's established. So at the moment, you know, basically, it functions a bit like social media, but essentially, and certainly the big channels are, to all intents and purposes, broadcast uh, media channels. And the viral videos are essentially small moments of broadcasting, kind of. Uh, they're not social media in the sense of, you know, what social media really is, you know, which is a, a relatively small network, or, or it's a network of networks, of uh, interchangeable consumers and producers, you know, that kind of thing. Um, in which the network is level, flat, you know what I mean? It's not a hierarchical, top-down, broadcaster, receiver, producer-consumer kind of relationship. But YouTube could quite easy, I was going to say, people could do it on the ground, actually. That's, it's something we could choose to, or one or two people could choose to do for themselves, really. But if it was instituted, so it would be really easy to do. All you need to do is just make a cap on the number of subscribers or the number of friends that a channel can have. You know, say 250, let's say. If you could only have 250 subscribers, it would be so interesting, actually. Yeah, I think YouTube, Google, should make a, a category, you know, because they have these weird categories of YouTuber and gurus and directors and something else, musicians. If there was one there which said social media, I don't know, whatever it would be, you know, whatever that descriptor would. But, and if you nominate your channel as that, then it limits the number of subscribers and or friends you can have to 250. I think it would probably also have to be the case that your material was only available to those people, didn't go wider. That might be it. Or you could elect to, which you probably could anyway, couldn't you? Uh, didn't go any wider. And maybe only those people could comment. Yeah, that would, that would, I think it needs to do something like that. 
because that would make a completely different landscape. You know, because certainly with um, with people who've got more than 250 subscribers, I mean, I've got more than 250 subscribers, but I've really got more than 250 viewers. I've just got lots of people who've come across an amazing atheist TJ site and they <laughs> never watched my videos, it's fine, I don't care. But, um, But I, I, I feel I'm more in the in a social media framework than I am in a broadcast media framework. You know, I watch other people's videos, and those are the people who's watching my videos, uh, and, and you know, and the commenting is going on as well. You know, so I just think it'd be very different if it was enforced. I think it would do something really interesting to the bigger channels, actually. Yeah, really interesting. In fact, I think some of the bigger channels should perhaps do this anyway, because it could easily. I mean, TGA probably the smallest channel that would still work with this, but it might work with even smaller subscriptions basis. You'd have to um, open a second channel, which I know TJ has done, TJ does live, uh, which is already, I don't know, probably 10,000 subscribers already for all I know, but you'd have to, to say really up front, I'm opening this second channel and it's only got 250 subscribers, it's not a broadcast media channel, it's a social media channel, which means that uh, I'll be making videos for you 250 people, I will be watching some of the videos that you people make, I will be responding to comments on this channel, and maybe commenting on some people who are also in that within that 250 charm circle. Um, you know, it'll be a completely different kind of a true, true uh, social media engagement, rather than TJ, Pat Condell, Thunderfoot, that kind of medium. Uh, yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, you could easily monetize that. I mean, a big channel could monetize that really easy. As I say, TJ is probably the smallest channel that make it would actually work. But maybe it'd be, maybe it'd work for the channels as well. Um, you know, where basically you make a video saying, "Look, I've got this as the channel I'm starting. It's a social media channel. Um, the nature of the the nature of the beast is that I have to be limited access. So I've got to be exclusive about it. Sorry, uh, but if you'd like to join me in my in my social media circle." It'll, I'm afraid I'm going to have to charge you for it, sorry, but it does require input from me. And it'll be $10 a month, let's say. $10 a month. 250 people, $10 a month. 2500 a month, not bad. Not bad. Um, you know, and those people would feel great. You know, if, uh, if your main channel had 140,000 subscribers, and all of your videos got 80, 90,000 views, and you, out of all those people, are one of the charmed 250 who gain special access to the to this maker who's so popular that you think that you regard so highly. You've got special access to this person. You've got a, a direct line of communication. They're responding to your comments personally. They know you by name. I mean, that's really different, isn't it? You know, really different. I think a lot. I think I think easily 250 people would pay ten ten dollars a month for that access. Probably more, actually. They'd probably pay more. In fact, there'd probably be a black market opens up. You know, you probably sell your access for, you buy an access point for ten dollars a month, and then sell it on to somebody else for twenty. I bet. You know, you could, I could easily imagine a black market gathering around that kind of thing. Yeah, that would be a great idea. YouTube feature I'd like to see: enforced social media networking. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. record some reaction shots on this video, shouldn't I? You know, then I could, when I put them all together, I could cut them in, you know. That would work. So I can do like a reaction shot of me uh, doing what, doing, uh, pretending there's someone doing something over there. Fuck off! Like that. That would be a great reaction. I'll cut that in. What else? Um, Sainsbury's! Reaction shot. Reaction shot like I'm having a crash. Ah! That's me having a crash at 85. M5, M42 turn off. Fingal Glen. Uh, what other reaction shots could I do? Board. Mm. I'll put that in somewhere. Drive without any hands, look. Do, 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 do. Steer with my knees. Uh, what else? I think it'll do actually in terms of reaction shots. 
turning around. Here's me turning around again, look. Okay. I think this video is probably full of continuity errors, actually. So I made some reaction shots. I just realised that I thought, I'll put those into the video earlier on. But I've got a coat on now. And I didn't have a coat on before when I, start, when I started this journey. I put it on when I stopped to walk the dogs a while back at Taunton. So I've got a continuity, and I've got a no front tooth in. Another continuity error. I took my tooth out because I'm eating chocolate declares, look. And if I tried to eat them with my tooth in, it didn't work really. I got my tooth punched out in a pub fight actually in Blackburn, the Ribblesdale Hotel in Blackburn, in 1975. Before most of you people watching this video were born. <laughs> it's so horrible. It was so horrible. I'm trying to think of the name of this lad actually, I can't remember his name now. Oh, I don't know. Anyhow, he took offence to something I said, punched me in the face. I don't think I said anything actually. I don't think I said anything offensive, I think he just wanted to like, I don't know, just punch somebody I guess. Yeah, anyway, sorry about the continuity errors. Actually, if you're listening to this, rather than watching it, you would never have known, would you? Oh well, I guess I've given the game away now. Not to worry. Fantastic.